Good afternoon. So this is Al Swigert with logging and testing and debugging. Oh my. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for having me here. This is logging and testing and debugging. Oh my. Oh my. Uh, I'm Al Swigert. I'm mostly known for writing this book, Automate the Boring Stuff with Python, but I've also written a bunch of other Python books, uh, all for beginners. Uh, and just to plug myself, they're released under Creative Commons licenses, so you can read them for free online at automattheboringstuff.com. Um, so I do a lot of beginner tech education stuff, and a lot of people, after working through some of these books, say, like, okay, what, what should I study next? What should I learn next? So I put together uh, this slide deck just covering a lot of intermediate topics because I figured that logging, testing, and debugging are sort of these things that uh, you need to start learning once your programs start getting larger in size and scope. So I'm going to be covering three different modules in the Python standard library and going over a bunch of functions in them, but you don't have to start scribbling down notes because you can download this slide deck and other links at bit.ly slash ohmypy. So, uh, why actually sit through a talk about something that you can just look up the documentation for? And I really have the mindset that you don't go to conferences to really learn about stuff, but really to learn about what you should learn. So these modules are, are pretty good. They're the logging module, the PDB module, and the doc test module. And it's surprisingly easy to get, uh, to get a handle on these modules. There's really only about four lines of code that you need to learn from each of them to get about 80% of the value out of them. And then you can look up the rest uh, in the documentation later. So, and it only takes about half an hour to go through all of them. So it's really easy to get started with those modules. So uh, let's get started. So the first one, logging. Um, I'm going to do something that's highly ill-advised for any presentation, and that is I'm going to do a live demo. So breaking out of PowerPoint and starting up Idle, the greatest IDE ever made, in my opinion. Uh, right, and I'm going to write a program. I'm going to write a program that adds two numbers together. So print, uh, enter, uh, print. Uh, Da, 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 da. Nothing will go wrong with this live demo. Da, 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 da. Incredibly sophisticated software right here. Adding two numbers. I'm actually going to start up a startup for adding two numbers as a service. Venture capitalists, just leave your checks right here on the podium. Uh, the sum of the first number and the second number is first plus second. There we go, ship it. I'm gonna just uh, save this as, um, go to my desktop. Uh, some kind of sum program dot py. All right, ship it. No, wait, we should actually test this maybe first. OK, let's run this and see what happens. Enter the first number, 4. Enter the second number, 2. The sum of 4 and 2 is 42. That's not the answer. Uh, OK, so there's a bug in this program. And now we're going to debug this program. And if you haven't been programming for that long, or maybe you've just picked up this same bad habit that I've had for a long time, you'd start debugging it like this. Hey, I need to figure out what's going on with this first and second variable, so I'm going to add a call to print. Maybe I'll just say, like, oh, debug in, ca in all caps because it's really important. And then uh, what's the type of, of this first variable? And then do the same thing for the second variable as well. And then rerun this program, entering four and two. And then I can see, oh, yes, I see. These variables are strings instead of integers because input returns strings. And so when I add these two together, it's actually doing concatenation. All right, I've debugged this program. Um, but now I'm not finished because I have all this extra print calls here that I need to take out. So I mean, I could comment these out, but that's terrible because now you're going to have all these commented out lines of code in your program. And if this becomes thousands of lines long, you're going to have dozens of these commented out print calls. Uh, I could just start deleting these lines, but that's also terrible because now I've forgotten some of these lines and I've left them in. Uh, maybe if I'm really thorough and I go through and I delete a whole bunch of lines, but now this is also terrible because 
I've accidentally removed some legitimate print calls. Uh, so I have to go through and delete all of this. Uh, wait. Yes, get rid of that. And now I'm done, except this is also terrible because now if I ever wanted to add those lines back in and continue debugging, I have to type them all over again. This is terrible. It's really terrible. This is called print debugging, uh, and it's a really bad habit to pick up. What you should always do instead of print debugging, whenever you find yourself doing this, is use logging and Python's logging module. There's several benefits to this. One, um, you have two separate streams now of, of output. You have your debug output and your normal printed output, and it's really obvious which is which. You're not sort of conflating the two with, by using print for both. Uh, it's also really easy to remove debug messages when you use the logging, me uh, the logging module, uh, and it's also really easy to put those debug messages back in after you've removed them. And finally, uh, with the print, there's no way of really keeping, uh, differentiating between really important debug messages and really uh, inconsequential ones. They're all the same because you're just using print. So, but with the logging module, you get to use log levels and I'll explain those in a little bit. But first, I'm gonna be wild and reckless and, uh, oh wait, nope, not yet. Um, I'm just gonna show you the four lines of code that you need for logging. Uh, it's really simple, importing it, basic config function will do the setup. Uh, debug will actually produce your debug message. It's kind of like the logging version of print. And then disable will then remove them all from your program. So now I'm gonna be wild and reckless and do another live demo. Let's go back to this program and start doing this the proper way. So import logging, logging.basicconfig, and then setting level to logging.debug. And this is kind of tricky, but I've gotten into the habit of just starting off the first two lines of all my programs by typing this in. So that way I can just start using logging statements instead of these print debugging uh, lines. So now I can say debug, and then let's get the type of that first variable, and then do the same thing with the second variable. And now I can just rerun this, and I can enter four and two, is that right? Oh. Whoops. Oh. Live demo gods. Why have you forsaken me? Okay, let's try that again and pretend the last 20 seconds never happened. Uh, enter the first number, four. Hey, okay, enter the second number, two. And now I can get this exact same information. Let me try moving this up so it's not at the very bottom of the screen. Now I get the exact same information before, but now well, for one, it's in red because technically this debug output is going to the standard error text stream instead of just the standard out text stream. So tools like idle or whatever IDE you use will be able to differentiate between them and say, hey, here's, uh, this is text that's gonna be in red right now. And if we wanna remove these, we can just go back up to the top and say, hey, logging.disable, uh, logging.critical. This is removing everything that critical level and below. Um, so when we run this again, and two, oh, two. Whoops, again, okay. Wait, did I save this when I ran it? There we go. And now you can see all the logging messages are taken out. I don't have to go through my entire uh, source code to pull out all of those. And you know, if I wanna put them back in, well, I can get away with just commenting out this one line right here, and then they'll all be back. So I, I know this is really great. This is much more effective than print, although you might be saying, well, this is all kind of complicated. I don't wanna memorize all of this. Can't I just use print debugging to do that? And the answer is yes, you could. That's the quicker way, and it's the easier way. But the problem is that you'll always just start off by adding one print call, and then you'll rerun your program and realize, oh, that's interesting. I wanna look at this other thing now. And then you'll add another print call and another print call, and it leads to the path of darkness. Um, and also, one of the great things is that logging, the logging module provides a lot of nice features to use on top of it that you didn't really realize you needed until you found them. So there's logging levels. This is five levels of priority or importance uh, that the logging module provides for your, 
your debugging messages. It's debug info, warn, error, and critical. You can see we pass these to the basic config and disable functions early on. Uh, passing debug to basic config says we want to log everything at debug level and above, and then disabling, uh, we pass it critical to say we want to disable all the critical level messages and below. So what these mean are fairly subjective. Uh, you can use them however you want, but here's the standard general meanings of this. Debug is for all your low-level information, just uh, you want the values and variables or things that you're working with. Uh, it's really easy just to sprinkle these throughout your program and then maybe just have it uh, go off to some log file somewhere that you ignore until something goes wrong and you want to go back and check what exactly the values were. Uh, info just records standard expected normal events, like a user logs into your app or uh, a database connection is made, really typical things that you expect. Having these messages uh, leaves a nice breadcrumb trail of what exactly your program has been doing. And then we get into the uh, more scarier one, uh, scarier levels, which I mark in red. Uh, warn, uh, warn is, um, you know, nothing's wrong, but uh, this thing happened that maybe you should look at it uh, in case things come crashing down later on. Uh, error is things have come crashing down, and so you'll want to leave a lot of information about uh, maybe a stack trace or other information about this. Um, and critical, critical is the really bad catastrophic failure where a service has gone down and it can't be restarted, make some 4 a.m. phone calls, uh, the end of the world is nigh, uh, sort of things. Now, again, these are all sort of uh, subjective. You can really use these functions. Uh, we were using the debug function before to leave messages at the debug log level. Uh, you can use whichever ones you want, but these are pretty much the standard ones that you have. Um, most often, I'm just gonna be, I use debug just because I just want to put information out there. And I'm really, once something like an error or a critical happens, the entire program has crashed on me anyway. Uh, but if you're creating a service that is constantly running, then error and critical uh, would be really helpful for you to use as well. So, uh, right, oh yes, and uh, just in case there's some confusion, the function names for these log levels to leave the message at that level are in lowercase, whereas those constants that represent the levels themselves are in uppercase. This was something that was kind of tricky and confusing because I would just see debug and critical sometimes in lowercase and sometimes in uppercase. Um, that's the difference between those. Uh, what I've been doing so far in my live demos, which have gone perfectly fine so far, is been uh, leaving these log messages out to the screen or to the terminal. Um, sometimes you don't want to do that, especially if you're producing a lot of these logging messages. You might want to just switch it off to a file. So before, I was just calling basic config and saying log everything at the debug level and up. Uh, if I want to produce, uh, if I want to send this out to a file, I can just add file name equals logfile.txt. Um, there is also a way where you can have it go out to both the screen and to a file. Uh, it's actually about 15 lines of code that I don't have memorized, but I copy and paste it from the same web page each time I need that. Uh, I'll go into that later if I have time. Um, but yeah, logging to a file is really great because then you can use the tail command to monitor uh, changes to this log file. So tail is a standard Unix command, so it's available on Mac and Linux machines. If you're on Windows, you can install SigWin, which I recommend you do anyway because it adds all these Unix commands to the Windows platform. Uh, tail will display the last 10 lines of any text file. And if you write tail-f, it will also monitor that log file so that you can see any updates made to it. And that's really handy because you can have all the logging output in a separate window. So let me show you what I mean by doing another live demo. So let's uh, go here. Okay, we're pivoting. We're gonna rewrite all of our code and get rid of all that legacy code. Instead, now we're going to do uh, import logging, logging, uh, do, 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 do. time random, let's see. Logging, basic config, I want to put this out to a file, so I say file name equals uh, logfile.txt, that's nice and descriptive. Um, level equals logging.debug. All right, and then we're going to have an infinite loop 
which <laughs> this live demo is gonna go great, I can tell. Uh, Logging.debug and just have a random uh, greeting. Say hello, hola, hi, howdy. And just add a time delay of one second in between each of those. So actually, let me go ahead and get rid of this for right now. And when we run this, we can see that every second, it's just producing some random logging output. I'll just kill that. But then adding this back in there, we can now have this go out to a file. So I'm gonna load up a terminal, go to my desktop, and then run tail-f, so I'm following the log file.txt. And you can see it prints out the, top, uh, the bottom 10 lines from this file. And then whenever this file gets updated, I can now monitor all the logging details from there in real time, which is pretty nice because then I can start developing in this other window and just keep an eye on this file. So let me kill this and then kill that part. So logging, it's great. Always, whenever you find yourself doing print debugging, switch to logging instead. Although really, print debugging and logging aren't really forms of debugging per se. It's more just uh, you have this trail of bread breadcrumbs and information about your program as it's run. Really, if you want to debug stuff, you should do actual real debugging. And if you have something like PyCharm or another IDE, it has a nice visual uh, graphical debugger where it highlights the source code that you're looking at right now and you can type things into a watch list and everything else. But you might not always have uh, that nice uh, development environment if you're running software on some system or platform where you only have a terminal to work with. In that case, Python is here for you. It has the PDB module, the Python debugger module. And this is great and it's only two lines of code. This is it, import PDB and pdb.setTrace. This will open up the debugger, and usually we just type it out on one single line using that semicolon uh, to split them because we'll just sort of find some place that we want to inspect with a debugger and then type that out. So let's do yet another live demo. Okay, I'm going to go back here. Let's say, um, Let me go all the way back. Perfect. Okay, here I am right here. Back to my initial, uh, that first and second part. Let's say I want to pop into the debugger right here, but I don't have idle to work with. Instead, I can just add this code temporarily right here. Import PDB, PDB set trace, and then I run F5. Enter the first number, four, and now it's broken into the debugger. And this is kind of a, well, it's a command line interface, so it's completely unhelpful. I mean, you can type help to get a list of commands, um, but it's not really as intuitive as using something like a graphical uh, debugger like in PyCharm. But that's okay because it's really not that complicated. So we're, com uh, we're confronted with this PDB prompt. Um, first thing that we wanna do is kind of figure out where are we in this program. So we can type out L dot or L and some line number to display the source code and it shows us we're right here on line eight uh, right after we've already run set trace. And so here's the line of code that's going to execute next. We can also use W to find out where we are in the stack trace. And you can see right here, this is actually just some functions inside of idle, which then ran our code. But we have been left right here in some kind of sum program line eight. And afterwards, we wanna figure out, okay, what's going on exactly? Now here's where normally, if we were doing print debugging, we'd just type out like print first or print whatever variable name, and then we would have to rerun the program and then uh, type in something else if we wanted to learn something else. But here, instead, we can just say, hey, P for, uh, first, print out what's the value of the first variable? And this is great because we can do any sort of expression that you would normally type into a debugger's watch list. Say I wanted to find, uh, type of the first variable. We can find out it's a string. We can really just enter any sort of expression right here. We effectively have an interactive shell in the middle of running our program. And next, if we just wanna start executing some lines of code, uh, we have the standard step into, step over, and step out, except they're called step next and return. 
uh, step into, oh wait, where am I? Let me list this, L dot. Um, so okay, we're about to run this line of code. Let me just type in for next, that's the most common one you'll do. Um, you can see it's, it's run that logging.debug line right there. Um, I could even step into a function call, in this case print, in which case I'm now like somewhere in idle's code that uh, handles printing for us. And then let's say I just wanna keep running lines of code until I can get, I can step out of this function. I can hit R for return, and I'll just keep running until I've returned out of here. I think I have to do it twice in this case. Um, and if I just want to continue running the rest of the program as normal until the next breakpoint or the next call to set trace, I can just hit C for continue. So, oh yeah, enter the second number two and the sum of four and two is 42. <laughs> Still haven't fixed that bug. So these are fairly standard uh, debugger techniques. You can also set breakpoints by just typing the B command and setting a line number or a function name. It's really simple to actually use all of these. Uh, pdb.setTrace effectively is setting your very first breakpoint. You can think of it as, as your first breakpoint into a program. I often type it either at the very st uh, top of a file or just near some code that I want to uh, break into. And uh, finally, the, the last major thing, this is just for all the VI users out in the audience, uh, the way that you quit the debugger is with the Q command. So it's really simple to quit. Uh, yeah, so that's it. It's really just these two lines of code, and now you have your text-based uh, debugger that you can use in pretty much any platform where you have text input and output. So you have a fully functional debugger, and you know it's not as nice as a debugger that comes with like PyCharm or something like that, but uh, the benefit of this is that PDB is part of the standard library, so it's always going to be there when you need it. It's never gonna leave you down, let you down or run around and desert you or something like, okay, I'm gonna move on to this. That was, I was really uncertain about that joke. Okay, testing. All right, testing. So testing is, is great. I'm not gonna talk about the unit test module because a lot of people talk about the unit test module and it's uh, fairly easy to find pretty good information out there. Uh, there's also another module in uh, the Python standard library called DocTest that not a lot of people know about. And DocTest is wonderful because it takes the, uh, the documentation that you should be writing but don't, and it also takes the unit tests that you should be writing but don't, and it combines them together so now you can ignore them twice as efficiently. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so doc test. Uh, doc test uh, effectively lets you put sort of light unit testing straight into your documentation. Uh, okay, live demo time. Let me see if I can do this. Um, okay, yeah, okay. Let's change that. Instead of adding two numbers with a bunch of code, we're now gonna create a function, add, add two numbers. This is adding two numbers 2.0 for my startup, which I will call Tulio. Let's see, A and B, and then uh, return A plus B. But because I'm a CMM level five software engineer, I will do all the correct principled things such as creating doc, test, or doc strings. So returns the sum of A plus B, A and B. All right, yeah, that looks good. It's technically documented. Check that off uh, the list. Um, but you know, of course, nobody reads documentation or nobody likes reading walls of text uh, or words or anything like that. It'd be really nice to just add a little sample input output for what this code does. So you can say, oh, here's an example. We'll do the, uh, the triple angle brackets of like an interactive shell prompt and say, hey, add two numbers. Well, if you pass two and two to this, you'll get four. And if you pass, add two numbers, four and two, you'll get six. And then this is great. You can run your automatic documentation generating software on this. It will then go through all of your source code, pull out all these doc strings, and then just make nicely formatted documentation for you. Um, the thing is though, I mean, these, this is just a string. A doc string is simply a multi-line Python string. There's no way, real way of guaranteeing that this is correct. You're just sort of eyeballing it when you're writing it out. So what doctest does, and it's just two lines of code that you have to know, import doctest, and you can run doctest.testmod to test this module. 
and you can run this, F5, and there's absolutely no output because it's, everything is checked out. But say we made a mistake and we said two plus two is five, you know, you have a very large two value. Um, and then you run this. You might just type this out not really thinking about it too hard, but then everybody reading your documentation is sort of like, well, what's up with these lines of code? But if you run doc test, um, doc test will go through all of the doc strings, run this as if it were at an interactive shell, and then report any mismatches between what it expected and what it got. So this is really handy. It really encourages you to one, write doc strings, and two, have code snippets in your doc strings, which are super helpful. And it also keeps them up to date because later on, let's say, you say, oh, okay, here's we have a feature, add two numbers, and we pass it the string four and two. When you type out 42, again, I wasn't really thinking, and technically this is wrong because uh, I accidentally typed out the integer form right here. And then I realized, oh, well, this is kind of silly. Let's do this. Let's just cast all of these to integers. Or you make some other uh, code level change to this. Um, maybe for a while we say, no, no, we wanted to actually concatenate strings. Uh, but then later we change the code. Um, now when we run this, it'll say, oh, okay, well, this is actually not the what we're expecting. Whoops. Int. Okay, that's like, what, only three failures in my live demo so far. Um, so whenever we make code changes, we can get this automated notification that, hey, your doc strings are also out of date. So six right there. We can keep running this, nothing happens, everything's working out perfectly. So that's really handy. Um, so this doesn't mean we can get rid of unit tests so far. We still need unit tests. Docs, uh, doc test really isn't a replacement for unit tests. It does provide a lot of the same things that unit tests provide, but at the same time, the unit test module gives you things like setup and teardown and a lot more sophisticated uh, functionality there. Doc tests are really uh, for your sort of initial unit tests that you want to write out. It just provides more test coverage. And it's really nice, especially if you know you were thinking that you were gonna get to unit tests later and then you never actually do. This will actually provide at least some uh, form of test coverage. Um, but yeah, doc tests aren't really replacements for unit tests. If you think about it, they're really more like unit tests for your documentation and just always assuring you that your documentation is up to date, which is kind of as important as having your code be up to date and correct as well. Because if people start looking at your documentation and finding that it's either missing or it's wrong or it's unexpected or just weird, um, they're probably not going to want to use your software or they're going to go online and say your software is sort of terrible. Um, so doc tests can be used as well uh, in conjunction with unit tests. And it's also technically testing a different thing than unit test does. Um, oh, uh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, can you repeat the So question? in doc test, if I want to use the class object, so will I be able to do that instead of normal variables? Yes and no. So I mean, one of the limitations of doc test is that you're sort of limited to what you can show with a string, like what would appear on a command line. And if you just have, like, let's say, uh, class uh, foo, and then I just say uh, a equals new foo. Oh, whoops, <laughs> I've been programming in other languages too long. Um, so right here when we show like a, this is an object right here, uh, we can't really copy and paste it. If you look in the documentation, there is syntax for just adding ellipses right here so that you can say, oh, the ellipses represent some random thing that you can't really predict ahead of time. Um, so it is possible to do that, but generally once you get to that level, you should go ahead and switch back over to writing unit tests. This is more for just um, really simple documentation when, when users are reading through your, doc, your docs and trying to figure out what exactly your code does. Um, right. And so here's like another Pythonic trick if you're new to programming or at least new to Python. Um, you can do this trick, you've probably seen it before, where you find if 
double underscore or dunder, uh, if dunder name dunder equals dunder main dunder. Um, I'm gonna have to explain this a little bit. Uh, so the dunder name dunder variable is one of those Python special variables. And when you run a, uh, a py file directly, it's going to be set to the string dunder main dunder. However, if you import that same uh, module, it'll be set to the file name instead. So this is a great way to just sort of differentiate between when, uh, when your script is being imported or when you're running it directly because maybe you wanna do different things such as run uh, your unit tests or in this case, run doc test, uh, dot test mod in that case. There is also a way of running doc tests from the command line so you don't have to add import doc test and doc test dot test mod to all of your files. Instead, you can just go to the command line right here and then run, what is it? I think python dash m doc test and then the file name, some kind of some program dot py and dash v for verbose mode. And this will show you all of the tests that pass or fail. Um, Without verbose mode, it'll just have no output whatsoever if everything's fine. So I usually prefer doing it uh, from the command line like this so I don't have to have import doc test in every single one of my files. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. What well, we're like half an hour into this and we've covered three different modules which are sort of intermediate level modules that are really useful to have once you've gotten started with them and they're not that complicated. It's like what, four lines of code for logging, just import it, uh, basic config to set up, uh, you have debug to actually produce the messages and then disable it to stop all the logging output later. Uh, you have debugging, which is just two lines of code that you often write as one, just importing it, and then pdb.setTrace to start up the debugger. If you ever forget oh, those single letter commands uh, inside the pdb debugger, you can just type help to get a list of them. Um, and for testing, you can use doc test, which uh, I am a huge fan of, of doing this. Um, you have doctest.testmod to run all of the tests, or you can just run it from the command line. But that's, as I said, that's about 80% of the value of these modules is just getting started with them and getting comfortable using them in all of your projects. Um, you can always consult the online Python documentation for these modules. It's pretty good and there's a lot of other different features that can uh, be useful to you later. But um, that's it. This is logging and testing and debugging. Oh my, I'm Al Swigert. I'm gonna shamelessly plug my book one last time um, because you can read it for free online under a Creative Commons license at uh, automatetheboringstuff.com. Um, thank you very much and I'll take questions. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, for logging, uh, I was gonna suggest that you show a recipe where I uh, assume you've got a bunch of different modules and you wanna be able to dynamically turn on logging only for say module C or C.D from the command line. You don't want to edit the code, you don't want to you know, do git commits or anything. Oh, okay. There um, are some standard recipes for this, but you just didn't show them. Oh yeah, yeah, I was actually sort of uh, worried about running out of time. Um, for the most part, I use logging Let's see, the, I mean, when I was talking about earlier with the standard recipe for um, uh, having your logging output go both to the screen and to uh, a file at the same time, I wrote up a blog post uh, several years ago about using this because I always forgot exactly like, oh yeah, basic config and then you can even set the format for all the individual log files right here. I would always forget all of this code, so I just wrote it up in a blog post and then copied and pasted it into my projects there. Um, and then to post to both of these, uh, it's actually all of this code if you want it to go to both the terminal and to a file. But uh, for things like disabling um, lo uh, output, uh, you do have to go into creating up individual logger objects um, if you wanna have uh, different outputs uh, for, for logging. Um, and this kind of goes into probably more detail than I just, I don't wanna like bore everybody with the actual details here, but you have like handler objects and also formatter objects for the format of each uh, message that you produce. But in the end, it's uh, even after all that setup, it's still just calling debug, info, warn, that sort of thing. Sure, um, but I think the key point is n never hard code the, the, the set level. 
to logging debug or something deep. Set oh, it right, to, yes. if, if module name equals foo, logging debug else info. Yes, and, there's. Or, or inherit it hierarchically from the parent. This is something Java people do a lot. Right, yes. So uh, I really wanted to keep this absolutely simple. The logging module does create, uh, does you know, sort of let you create these logger uh, objects or other things like that. Um, but if you just want to get, re like, have something work really simply, um, especially if I'm throwing away, uh, or if I'm writing throwaway scripts that I'm just going to run maybe just a couple times, um, I still want to avoid. I want to get myself out of the habit of just throwing print calls in there. So usually, what I do is just import logging, logging uh, dot basic config. Uh, to get that started. Gotcha. Thanks. Uh, when you are in the debugger, can you change uh, uh, the value of a variable that then the program is going to pick up? Let's totally find out why. So import PDB, or find out if we can. Uh, import PDB set trace. I believe I've been working with a lot of different programming languages recently. Um, whoops. Or here, I can just do this right here. I believe you can. I'd be really surprised if the answer was no. Um, so we can print out the value of a right here, and we can do something like a equals three. No, I guess we can't. Is that? Oh, um, what was that? Oh, OK, yes. a equals right, yes. And now we can actually make changes uh, to the individual variables or do new assignments. Uh, oh, uh, what do you mean? Right, yes. So this is just in this one uh, session. It's not actually changing uh, anything in the source, in the original source code. Like the only change that we've actually made is just this one line. I believe Sublime Text also has a hotkey that will automatically you can hit like control something or other, and it'll add import PDB, PDB dot set trace uh, to whichever line you're currently on. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so let me just do uh, next. Next. Oh, I guess I don't have anything. Uh, let me just quit out of this. Let's try this. Print, add two numbers, two and two. And then we'll just continue from here. And then we can see, yeah, we've changed the, the value inside uh, the function. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. And I think it's snack time now. <laughs>